Other Conversations. I am your host, Isis, and today I have a special guest with me, Pastor Nicole Johnson. She is a mother, she's a pastor, she's an educator, and so much more. So today we're just going to sit back and talk and conversate and find out more about this dynamic woman of God. <laughs> so first off, tell everybody, um, let's, let's find out a little bit about Nicole. Who is Nicole? What's your background, your childhood? What was that like? Wow. Who is Nicole? Who am I? Well, I feel that I am a very successful woman without all the living the lavish lifestyle Mm -hmm. or all the cars or anything like that. I feel successful because I have accomplished so much. Mm -hmm especially for my childhood and when you you know when you ask that because I was adopted when I was young Mm. my mom gave me away and I grew up thinking that my mom didn't love me so I grew up with rejection but everything that I have asked God for he gave it to me and I never understood why because I'm like God why would you put me in this situation my mom nice house three brothers I'm the only girl why didn't she keep me Mm. so coming up with rejection and and I'm asking God God why me but every time I ask him why me he will push me forward Mm. you can do this you can finish elementary school you can finish middle school you can finish high school through it all Mm -hmm. and growing up feeling rejected I was also feeling successful because I was accomplishing My. so much, but didn't know how. You understand? Mm-hmm. So, as um, as growing up, and I don't want to start crying. <laughs> Go for it. When you begin to reflect <laughs> back, you know, a lot of things um, start coming up. Mm-hmm. Growing up, my adopted mom got really sick mm-hmm. with cancer. And I said, God, everything that I have asked you for, you have given it to me. Um, please don't take her away from me wow. because this is all I have. This is the only person that really showed me love. This is the only one that took me in. Now, mind me, the person that adopted me was my mom's next door neighbor. Wow. She said to my mom, if you have a girl, I want her. When my mom came home from the hospital, she gave her to me three days later. Because back then, they, you know, the women stayed in the hospital three mm-hmm. days. So when she, you know, found out she had cancer and she was, you know, getting real very weak and rejecting the chemo, I began to pray. That's when I first started really, really praying. And how old were you? I was about 12 years old. Wow. And I was praying. She would lay down and I would plait her hair and I was praying, God, heal her, heal her. But she passed away. Mm. And I couldn't cry. I couldn't even cry at the funeral. I was so angry. Mm. So on top of rejection, I was angry. I was bitter. I was bitter with everybody around me. I was bitter with God. And I brought that into my mom's home because my mom had to get me back after then. When I brought that into my mom's home, because I couldn't understand why why you give me away and not why you want me back right now. And my mom tried to, you know, get me to understand why, but I really didn't understand why. So we didn't have a relationship Mm. while I was there. And I stayed there three years. I moved out my mom's house when I was 17 years old because I was still bitter. I was still angry, angry with God. So I did, I lived this lifestyle that, you know, teenagers live. Mm -hmm. Drinking, smoking, boyfriends, and doing everything the wild way. And to the point that, um, at the age of 16, I gave birth to a little boy. Um, when he was nine months, I said, God, I don't want to live this life anymore. And I tried to commit suicide. Mm. And took a whole bottle of Tylenol PM mm-hmm. and a can of Coca-Cola. <clears throat> and as I felt myself getting weaker and weaker, God said, not yet. Mm. I'm like, okay. He's like, you're not going to die. Went to the hospital. You know, they lock you up in a little crazy house or mm-hmm. whatever. You know, got better. I said, 
God, what am I doing here? Right. What am I doing doing in this place? Why am I here? He said, this is another holding pattern that I have you in. The holding pattern that you was in before, you needed to be there for your spiritual growth. That was being adopted. Mm -hmm. Now you're in this holding pattern because now you need to hear from me. Mind me, to me, I wasn't saved. And to me, I really didn't have a relationship with God. Right. But I knew how to hear his voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Came out of that situation and started dating Pastor Jermaine at the age of um, 14. That's, you know, in between. And we was, you know, back and forth or whatever. He went off to college, came back, and um, got married. And I'm just trying to sum up everything. And we got married, but I brought all that into my marriage, mm -hmm. all that baggage, rejection, feeling unloved, angry, all of that into my marriage. And my brother called me one day, and he said to me, he said, Nikki, he said, you're still angry. I said, yes, I am. He said, do you realize that you brought all that stuff into your marriage? I said, yeah. I said, but I'm going to be okay. He said, no, you're not. He said, but I want to tell you this. He said, God allowed mom to give you away because mom had to listen to the Holy Spirit. Mom knew she couldn't take care of you. She knew that that would be a safe haven for you because she knew the purpose that God had for you. And I was like, okay. He said, I can count every year that somebody broke in our house and tied us up and put us in the closet. Oh, wow. And we were, they were they boys. Mm -hmm. He said, if you were there, he said, those men probably would have raped you mm -hmm. or killed you. And I began to cry. And that just began to open a light or that began to just open so much up and say, God, um, you had a plan mm -hmm. for me before I entered my mother's womb. She could have aborted me. But you put me into places and hovered over me to keep me safe. And I look at my life now, and, you know, sometimes we want to hold on to our own right. hurt. But God's saying, no, this is what I did for you. You don't have to hold on to it. We beat ourselves up more, mm -hmm. and God done forgave us. But I could not forgive myself because of of feeling angry and how I used to treat people and how I treated my mom. Right. And I'm like, you did everything that God told you to do. You was obedient in what I did to you. But I look at myself now after everything that I went through and everything that I had a vision for and I wanted to do in life, I have done it. I have two beautiful <clears throat> children and I wanted to have a boy and a girl. God gave me that. I asked God for Jermaine. I told him at 14 that he was going to be my husband. God gave me that. I asked God, I said, God, I want to finish school, you know, finish high school. He did that. I said, God, I want to get a bachelor's degree. He did that. God, I want to get a master's degree. Everything I have ever asked God for, he have done it. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes in the flesh, I still ask God, why? 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 And I know it's a purpose and a plan for me. And he has not revealed everything or laid everything out for me. Because I believe I, it will scare me. Mm -hmm. it, I, I believe it will. But in all essence, God is still keeping me. He is. And I can say I have dealt with instant. You, you can call me beautiful all day. All day. You're a beautiful woman. But the insecurity is Insecurity still will keep you in bondage. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that held me back for so long because of that rejection. That's why I felt insecure, unloved, mm -hmm. father not being around, all of that. And I see myself now. I might not be a millionaire here on earth, but I feel like a millionaire. You understand? Yeah. That's now I won't. Stuff. I won't pay. Um, fifty dollars for a blouse. <laughs> <laughs> I can have it in my pocket, <laughs> right? But I feel, I feel, I, I feel good. Mm -hmm. I feel really good. But it, I had to go through a process, mm -hmm. and that process did not feel good. In the midst of all of that, God still kept me. And I look at myself now. I'm like, wow, 
I've been married for 18 years. My son is 23. My daughter is 17. My grandson is four. My other grandson is six months. Like, I'm a grandmother. <laughs> really? Yeah, when you said that, I was like, nah, not even. Yes, yes. But everything I have ever asked God for, he has done it. And he's still doing it. He's still doing it. And he surprised me every, every day. Every day. So you were saying that, you know, young, young women have to deal with insecurity anyway. And there is a root to the insecurity. So what do you say to a young girl who is dealing with insecurity? How do you help her realize that her actions are based in some type of history? It's amazing that you asked me that because I've been in, um, mentoring young girls, I, I think, forever. And now I'm in a position now because, you know, I teach. Mm -hmm. And I was a social coach for four years. So that was my way of mentoring young girls. Um, I tell them, I build a relationship first. You have to build a relationship first in order for them to open up. Now that's good that you said that yeah. because that's the problem right now. Yes. Is there's a big divide because there's no relationship. Exactly. They the young people don't feel that they can relate. Exactly. They, they feel like they're being talked at, mm -hmm. not talked to. Exactly. So they don't really open up and share that's information. Right. That's right. And um, like for example, the teachers will bring young ladies to me and say, Miss Johnson, just talk to them. You know, and I ask them, is there anything you want to talk to me about? No. What did you do? Nothing. I said, y'all know what? Y'all all say that. I said, but let me tell you about Miss Johnson. I was bad in school. I was real bad, but I never disrespected an adult because I always knew that I read what I saw. Then they ask me, what does that mean? What goes around comes around. And, and I say, in this generation, it comes around quickly. And they'll sit there and listen. I was like, just tell me, you know, what did you do? Did you talk out loud or whatever, whatever? And then they begin to open up because I don't told them about myself. Right. Um, I never tell, I want them to verbally tell me what they did wrong before, because if they don't open up, you can't answer anything. And then I tell them how beautiful they are. I'm like, how can I help you? And I begin to give them strategies. If a teacher say something to you and you're not doing, it, doing anything, don't say anything at all. If you can't control yourself, come ask for Miss Johnson. Ask your teacher, say, can, you, can I go speak to Miss Johnson? You know, if I got to be your way of escape, let it be that way of you. You know, just building that relationship, mentoring them, talking to them. And when they begin to open up, they're like, honey, you can begin to nurture them. Because right. they'll be going to ask you, um, Miss Johnson, um, can you, I, you know, I, I need a maxi pad or I need a sweater. Um, do you have any extra clothes? Or, you know, they begin to open up and they begin to begin talk about their home life. Mm -hmm. And that's how I begin to actually, you know, talk to them, mentor them, encourage them, embrace them, um, and just building that relationship. That's what they need. They need relationships. And when you have a relationship with somebody, my God, mm -hmm. you can you can take them by the hand. Then you can go anywhere with them. And that's how, and that's just me. And I couldn't open up to nobody. Mm -hmm. Everybody always saw my fault. Didn't know what I was going through. Even the teachers in school, they didn't know what I was going through in school. They just knew that I wouldn't do my work. So they wanted to, you know, actually label me. And, I, and you know, I could sit and just look at people like, you're not going to ask me what happened at home. You're not going to ask me how I feel. You're not going to ask me have I been adopted. And, these and I was, that you that were I was in my head. Right. And I would sit up in class and just be angry. Like, I don't, I know how to divide, but I don't want to divide right now. Mm -hmm. And when we were in school, they used to beat us. I don't want to do it right now because this is what I dealt with at home. This is what I'm dealing with inside. Mm -hmm. Can you help me some other kind of way? So I just shut down. So they're like, she got a speech impediment. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. Right. You know, but I couldn't verbally say it because nobody ever tried to really build a relationship with me. Right. So I actually stepped into my student's shoes or a young lady's shoes without judgment. Without judgment. Because you don't know what kind of environment they come from. So you get to know them first before you begin to, you know, 
So, and, that, and, and that's how I look at it. That's why I know God got me into the school system to begin to nurture the one who, who just is open to be nurtured. So is um, that that's what influenced you to become an educator? I wanted to actually teach, teach cosmetology. Mm. That's what, that was my goal. And I, we would clean, me and Pastor Mayne would clean the garage one day, and um, I found this paper and it was sold up. And it said, dear God, I want to be an educator. And I did not specify mm-hmm. on the paper right. what I wanted to teach, but I knew what I wanted to teach. Mm-hmm. And God just opened that door for me to teach. I didn't, you know, I didn't know nothing about the math, the language, arts, science, social studies. I'm like, really? He was, God, you really want me to teach these students this? Right. I want to teach here. But um, God had to, God did it. Pull the potential out of me and say, you can do it. You didn't like math in school, but look at you, you're teaching it now. Not only are you teaching it, but your student scores are increasing every year from 75% to 85%, not 99%. So I'm like, wow. And, it's, and, and you know what? It's not me. It, it's nobody but God. Because I don't take the credit. I don't take the credit for nothing. I don't ever, I don't ever want to boast anything. I don't ever want to take the credit for anything. As soon as you start taking the credit, you start both, and then you start getting big-headed, and you think it's all about you. Mm-hmm. As soon as you get on that pedestal, hmm. somebody's going to knock you off. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, in, in the back earlier, you okay. were talking about pushing people towards their purpose. Oh, my goodness. Talk about that. <laughs> um, yes, in the back I was saying that I love to see women give birth naturally and um in my you know my family my cousins my sister-in-law you know had babies and i used to love to go to hospitals watch them have babies my mom my mom used to always say you love to go and watch women have babies and this and i said mom i love to say push push come on come on it was like an excitement Mm -hmm. and so and i just thought about that in the back um me being a person to push and help that woman push to encourage them you know to push them from where they are to where they need to be, mm. in spite of what they're going through, instead of saying just stuck. Right. Because guess what? You feel good after you done had that baby. Because <laughs> when you carry it, and it's time for you to deliver, you feeling miserable, you feeling tired, worn out. When you got somebody there coaching you, saying push, and as soon as you push that baby out, it's like a, <sighs> and it's now you want. And, and I know by me having a baby. I just wanted to sleep. Just don't put this baby in my lap. I just want to lay back. I want to go to sleep because I'm tired. Right. It's like you're in a peaceful mode mm-hmm. after you done gave birth. So I know that's my calling is to help women just push into their purpose and push into their destiny and keep pushing them and encouraging them and, you know, ministering to them so they can begin to walk in their calling. Mm-hmm. So, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Branch Worship Center. Come as you are and go where you're planted. Come as you are and go where you're planted. At the branch, at the branch, at the branch. Weekend service at 10.30 a.m. Come as you are. Wanna grow higher? Come as you are. Blossom with us. Weekend service at 10.30 a.m. Branch, 2285. Join Pastor Jermaine and Nicole. www.thebranchwc.org. Be there. Be there. We specialize in graphic and fine art. Brand your business professionally and affordably. Visit us online today at shoneyd.wix.com forward slash shoneydart. I hear that girl.com, the premier website for all women. Fashion, inspiration, entertainment, and more. Log on today www.ihearthatgirl.com Well, let's talk about, we've, we've heard Pastor Jermaine, Pastor Jermaine. 
let's talk about the your hubby. Okay. Yes. And let's talk about, you know, how you all met and then we'll talk about how it is for you to be married for eighteen years. How, really? how do you do that? <laughs> so I'm the to see. Oh my God! So, <laughs> do I really have to tell it? I'm gonna tell the story. Yes. Pastor Maine was the quiet boy in school, the cutest. Now, mind me, he's one best looking in school, the cutest and the quietest boy in school. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was in school. I was always the leader in school. I was like, I'm gonna get him. I'm gonna get him. So one day, my sister and I walked to her friend house, and he was doing something in his backyard, and. And I was looking at the slide door. I was like, that's Jermaine? And he was like, yes. I was like, ooh, take me in the backyard. Let me see him. Now, it's a fence, like a little short fence. And um, he called him to the gate. And I was like, what's your name? He said, Jermaine. I said, give me your number. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm 14. Girl, gave me his great. number. Yes, gave me mm -hmm. his number. And um, we started dating at 14. And um, I think we were dating for almost like six months. And I told my mom, I said, Mom, um, God told me that Jermaine is going to be my husband. She was like, what? She was like, all right, I'm going to pray about that. I said, Mom, God really told me Jermaine is going to be my husband. Mm -hmm. She was like, I'm going to pray about it, Nikki, okay? I said, okay. Um, but after, you know, going through that high school stuff, mm -hmm. we broke up, and he went off to college. And I was sitting in the classroom. And I was crying, 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 crying. And this girl walked in and she sat behind me. She was like, you know what? Me and my boyfriend broke up for five years and we got back together. And I said, five years? <laughs> and I looked at her. Mommy, I ain't never see that girl no more. Mm. Don't even know what she looked like. We broke up for exactly five years. Wow. He moved seven hours away to Tallahassee and I was staying in Miami. Mm -hmm. Mind me, I don't know, y'all, I don't know. It's like an interchange called Wildwood. I was going, I we was traveling, and we happened to see each other traveling, and we met eye to eye. And I said, okay, God, what are you doing? <laughs> Lo and behold, we got back together, and we got married. When me and Jermaine got back together, he was not, quote, unquote, saved, and I wasn't either. But um, I know it was a calling in his life. And when I saw it, I was like, uh-uh. So I don't want to be no, what? <laughs> I don't want to be no pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be no first lady. I don't want to put on a long dress. I don't want to put on all this stuff going through my head. Right. Don't put me on a long dress, no skirt, no hat. I, you know. <laughs> but we got married, and Jermaine he wanted a relationship with God. He really wanted one, um, and we had to learn how to balance because he had mentors and he was at the church all the time and this and that. And I had to realize that it came to, God sat me down one day and he was like, where would you want your husband? In the strip club where he used to be or in the church? Because you can go to the church and find him. In the strip club, mm -hmm. you might not find him. Mm -hmm. Not him. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So I had to humble myself and, you know, really embrace his calling and actually begin to see my calling. But 18 years, and to be honest with you, it looked like we've been together from the beginning of time. It, it almost looked like we were made for each other, and I'm getting ready, you're gonna open your eyes real big. <laughs> I didn't have to change my last name. You got the same last we have name? the same last name. Like and cousins. We're not cousins. That's something I ask God for. I ask God, I say, God, I, when I get married, I don't want to change my last name. Mm. And I married a man who had the same last name as mine. Now, my sister married somebody. Her last name was Johnson. She married somebody named Wesselhoff. I laughed at her. I said, see, you should ask God for what I asked God for. <laughs> Wesselhoff? I could say her name for a whole year. <laughs> but, yeah, 18 years, it has been um, a challenge, but a good challenge. Mm. And I so I always say, I afford it out there in the world, and I'm going to fight for this. And would I give it up? Nothing for the world. I wouldn't give it up. Mm -mm. He's my best friend, my husband, I mean, my mentor, my teacher. He teach me. I wouldn't be 
where I am today if he would not have pushed me. He was my midwife to push me. Honey, you can do this. Honey, do it. Do it, honey. I'm behind you. Mm -hmm. Honey, what you need? Honey, go take the picture. Honey, let me take a picture for you, put yeah. you on the billboard. Mm -hmm. All of that, he, he, he actually pushed me mm -hmm. to where I am. He encouraged me. I, don't know, I didn't have anybody else. Honey, you're beautiful. You know? So, so he makes it easy to, to be the pastor. Yes. Very easy. Very, very, very easy. Um, and I think I didn't want it because seeing other first ladies mm -hmm. and it's like they're untouchable. You can't touch them. Mm -hmm. um, what they wear, how they act, the click. I didn't like that. I was like, okay, if I ever be this, I want to be the opposite of yeah. this. Um, I want to be touchable. I want, you know, somebody to be accountable to me, and I want to be accountable to them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sit on the front row by myself. Right. Or you understand? Mm -hmm. So I want to be the total opposite. Now, I, you know, I know respect or whatever, but I'm like, those long skirts and stockings <laughs> and white shoes, I ain't going to be able to do it. <laughs> but um, God showed me, you know, Nicole, you're unique. Mm -hmm. And I know the Holy Spirit will convict me for, for what I wear, how I act, what I do, and hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I'm enjoying this. I'm, I'm really enjoying this journey. I am, and I used to hate for people to depend on me. I hated it, but uh, I'm enjoying it. God has made it very easy. Pastor May has made it very easy. Um, my mom and I are best friends. Um, I forgave her. I told her everything that I used to go through, and I, you know, sometimes I feel like she's trying to make up for it or whatever. And I told her, I said, Mom, that's what I have went through. That's the process I had to go through. Right. But when I say we're so close, when me and my mom look like twins, I love her. Um, and she stays, she stays in Florida. Uh, we have many in our relationship to the point that I can talk about what I went through, but it don't affect me anymore. You know, you don't forget, but you, know, you forget. Right. And um, I can say this, that it's to a point that it's not a forgiving anymore. It's, it was done. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, just walking in it. And I actually thank my mom. Thank you. I was not so right. Thank you. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you for giving me away. Because you gave me away to the right person that raised me up in the church. I learned how to pray. I learned how to seek God. Um, so I I thank God for my past. Everything that I went through, I thank God for. Because, you know, look how I've accomplished so much. Mm -hmm. I've done so much. Right. And everything I went through, I'm not dead. You know, right. I'm here to talk, right. actually talk about it. So I thank God for that. Yeah. So let's talk about your legacy. What What would you want your legacy to be? What would you want oh, to be? Oh my gosh. Oh. I, why would you ask me? That's the best question. <laughs> <laughs> I have never thought about that because when you talk about your legacy. I want to be thought of as a loving, giving, caring, nurturing person. Um, and I think about that. I have thought about, you know, God, if I leave this earth today or tomorrow, what would somebody yeah. say about me? And I know, and I always, I always say I want people to see my heart. I don't want people to see, you know, the flesh mm -hmm. or the facade or right. the 20-inch weave or how I dress or how I smell. I want people to see my heart. Mm -hmm. So I just want to, my, I want my legacy to be people knowing who I am, what my heart is really like. And with my children, I have seen pastors and pastor wives not knowing how to balance, not mm -hmm. meaning to, you know, neglect their children. Mm -hmm. I want my children to say, this is the kind of mother 
that I had and shared. I don't want my children to sit at my funeral and not cry and be angry with the church and say, my mom and my dad spent so much time at the church, so much time with other children and not me. So the legacy I want for my family is to say, my mom took care of us, knew how to balance the church, knew how to build relationships with all of us, giving, encouraging, just loving. That's a deep question. It is. It is. Because, you know, with the legacy, when you start thinking about what legacy you're going to leave, mm -hmm. it changes your actions. That because is so true. You have to get started yes. in order to leave that mm -hmm. legacy that you have in your mind. Yeah. So, yeah. it really gives you a good view of what mm -hmm. have I been doing so far? What have wow. I been doing? You know? Yeah. So, the legacy. Join us next week on Conversations for part two of this riveting interview with Pastor Nicole Johnson.